Monday, remember, we covered um, fixed non deformant control volumes and the way the conservation mass is expressed in control volumes. Uh, and remember, what the statement there was is that using the Reynolds transport theory and the idea that the mass of a system has to remain constant, you can write that DDT, control over a control volume, rho. V plus integral over control surface, O V N A is equal to zero. 
right? So this works if your control volume is non-deforming. However, if, you're, if your control volume is moving, or if control surfaces are moving because it's deforming, or the entire thing is translating along, such as the example of the jet engine, just remember you have to be careful about how you pick your velocity here, because it ends up being the, the relative velocity of the control volume, and uh, re the control volume's velocity relative to the fluid that goes into uh, this vector here. So we're going to pick up with this by um, <coughs> applying this to the same, we, we solved this problem on Monday, right, using a fixed control volume, uh, figuring out how quickly the water level in this rectangular tank is rising as we dump water into it at a fixed rate. Um, we're going to go ahead and resolve it, this time using a deforming control volume and see how that changes the way we approach the problem. So the control volume we pick in this case is instead of being the entire tank, we just pick the, uh, the volume that is filled with water at the moment that we're analyzing it. So the control volume is rising at whatever rate the, uh, the water level is, right? It's expanding. So we have here a deforming, uh, deforming volume, and it's actually the rate of increase to the height of the control volume that we're going to be looking for in calculating the rate of the water level rise. So, um, I shouldn't have erased that, should I? Well, I'll go ahead and rewrite it. Okay. Now, before, when we saw this before, remember, with the fixed control volume, the nice thing was that we could say, hey, it's steady, I can set DDT, or this partial derivative term, uh, to zero. But we can't do that anymore, right? Because now our control volume is no longer, you know, it's, 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 it's no longer itself steady volume. And so this actual volume, uh, the, area, the volume integral itself is changing. So what we need to do is figure out first What's the mass contained within the control volume at any given instant? Sorry. Well, we can figure out the volume of the control volume, right? Based on, it's just going to be 5 by 2 by h times the density of the fluid inside of it. Because it's enclosing only water at this time, none of the air. We say, So if we go ahead and calculate, right, that, that, so that's, um, that's this term right here, right, the integral of rho dv ends up giving us rho by p by 2 p by h. So if we take the partial derivative term, uh, what we end up with is d dt mcv is equal to simply rho by 5 by 2 squared by dh dt. Okay. So this is the term we're actually looking for. Remember, so we've taken care of our unsteady term right there. So the next thing we need to do is look at this convective term. Uh, and ask, all right, so what part of this control volume actually has mass flowing across it? Well, it's only going to be the top, right? And the only area where mass is flowing across is, again, through the, the jet right here. So we have made the assumption here, um, well, we made the assumption before that the velocity itself is uniform. So 
uh, if we say that we have the jet velocity j and we have it, the jet area aj the product of these two gives us the flow rate in the jet right But what we need to do is count for the relative uh, velocity between the jet and the rising top of this control volume. So what's the velocity of this control volume's upper surface going to be? It's what we're looking for in the problem. So how do we represent it? DH over DH. Good. Yes, DH, DT. And the... Uh, the velocity of the, the transpiration across the control volume is, or across the control surface, is V. So what we end up with is uh, that W is equal to, remember, hold on, Say the magnitude of W is equal to Vj plus dH dt. Okay? Dotted with n, we've got n is pointing up, right? The velocity of the water relative to the control surface is pointing opposite the normal direction. So what we end up with is. W dot n to the negative VG, Vj plus uh, dH dt. All right, integrating this over the area of the jet, we end up with this, uh, remember it's uniform, so it just becomes a multiplication. So what we end up with is that m dot n is equal to negative Vj plus dH dt times rho a. All right, so we got our, we have our two terms. We have our DDT, the mass inside the control volume. We have the rate of mass flow into the control volume. So plugging these into this top form of the equation, we end up with rho times 10 feet squared times dH dt minus Vj plus dH dt rho A is equal to zero. We factor out the dH dt one side and you know move everything else over to the other side and solve for that. Uh, algebra just gives us that uh, dH dt is equal to uh, qj divided by um, 10 feet squared minus a sub j. And uh, what's cool here is this is the exact same answer we got before. Which shouldn't surprise anybody, right? The, the fact that we made up in a different imaginary box than our first imaginary box shouldn't change the rate at which the, the box fills with water. It's just that we chose to analyze uh, the box in a different way. Before, we said, all right, let's look at the entire box, see how quickly the mass inside of the box changes. We have to recognize that the air flowing out of the box constitutes a system, so it doesn't actually have a change in mass that contributes to the problem and it ends up being a little more complicated. This is an example where using a, a deformable control volume can actually speed up the solution process and make it a little more uh, intuitive, right? So, uh, the plan for today is um, we're actually running like um, about one or two lectures kind of 
I have, have a little bit of wiggle room right now. So we're gonna sort of slow down and really work on this stuff because this is the like the thing that you're gonna want to come away from this class with this control volume analysis. This is gonna be the biggest tool in your arsenal. Um, so today we're gonna talk about uh, conservation of linear momentum, which is why things like this happen. You know, you end up able you're able to use water jets to propel boats, why jet engines work, why airplanes fly. You know, these can all be accounted for or why spraying hoses at random objects makes them move. This is um, they put the weirdest videos on the online material for this course. Uh, anyway, uh, so we're going to talk about why this happens, der der derivation of this using the Reynolds transport theorem. It's pretty much the same thing you've been seeing, but with linear momentum instead of mass. We'll talk about control volume choices, and we'll work an example. And then uh, in the last half hour or so of class, I'm going to pass back the exams, and we'll go over the, um, the, the solutions to the problems on the exams that uh, tended to be the most problematic. So, linear momentum, second, zoom, second law of Newton. We all know it as F equals MA. But what it really tells us is that the force acting on a system of particles, whether that system of particles is a blob of fluid or it's a baseball, is equal to the rate of change of linear momentum of that system of particles. So if the density of that system of particles remains constant, that the volume remains constant, you know, um, then the only thing that changes with time is the velocity. Remember we say that P, linear momentum, is equal to mv. Time rate of change of this. If m remains constant, which it usually does because it's a system, and we just spent the last lecture and a half on that, the only thing that changes with time is velocity. So you end up with ddt p is equal to m dd d v dt, which is equal to ma, right? Some of the forces on the system is equal to the acceleration of the system. It shouldn't, this is uh, you know, familiar to all of you, but just as in the last case, it's familiar when you're working with systems. When you have a collection of particles, you can say, yes, there's a force pushing on this system of particles, therefore, intuitively, it's got to go somewhere. Uh, what do we do with this when we're dealing with a fixed region in space? There's no acceleration going on, right? That volume, our control volumes aren't accelerating. How do we take this Lagrangian conservation law and put it into a control volume where our math can deal with it? So that's what we're going to be discussing today. But first things first, uh, let's figure out what it actually says. So, um, as I just said, the material derivative of the um, of the uh, system uh, momentum can be equated to some of the forces on the system. And this holds in any of what we call inertial coordinate systems. I said before, inertial coordinate systems, um, the easiest, you know, the easiest way to remember them are they're coordinate systems that are not themselves accelerating. If a coordinate system is accelerating, then it really screws with your ability to find out what the acceleration of particles in that coordinate system is. If it's translating with a steady velocity on the other hand, you can just jump on board that coordinate system and analyze things as if nothing's moving, right? So the example I gave was like this chair, I'm kicking this chair, right? We can say, well, yeah, kick the chair, it moves, experiences some acceleration, our coordinate system's fixed. But if you're using the sun as a coordinate system, then we're not fixed anymore. We're on this planet that's zooming around with a nominally, you know, at least tangentially somewhat steady velocity, right? Uh, so, how do we express this in uh, our conservation form for a control volume? Right. Well, we've got our Reynolds transport theorem. Right. For any material volume or any material property B. Remember, B is the total amount of something. In this case, the total momentum. And in the last class, we said that if big B is momentum or mv, then little b or the amount of momentum per unit mass is equal to what? whispered. Velocity, right? If big B is equal to mv, just divide out the m. 
velocity is momentum per unit mass. Okay, so anywhere we see little b, we need to plug in velocity. Yeah, so go ahead and write down what you think that looks like, and we'll see if uh, your expression looks like what we're going to write down here in a moment. So you should have something like this, some in these boxes, right? And if you go ahead and ignore this. Um, if uh, and so if we if we proceed through and just plug in, you know, mechanically plug in velocity as our momentum per unit mass, right? Then what we end up getting is. expression of conservation of linear momentum. Alright, now this might be kind of confusing. Uh, I hope I hope it's a little bit confusing because that means you're you're thinking ahead here. This is uh, this is, is is challenging the first time you see it because you're like, oh what? I have a vector in there now. It's no longer, you know, mass it's pretty intuitive. You say mass goes in, mass has to come out. It's a it's a scalar, it's something you can put on scale and measure, but velocity's got different components. Depends on the coordinate system you're using. What does it mean for velocity to convect in and out of a out in and out of a control volume, right? What does it mean for something to to to, to look at this vector times rho times the same vector dot with a normal product? Is this actually telling us? Okay. And the way to think about this is first before I get into that interpretation. Uh, probably the bigger question to ask is why do we even care about this? You know, like we said, um, Newton's uh, conservation of linear momentum applies to a system of particles. So what, like, what allows us to, to, to turn this into um, a form that involves only volumes and space and doesn't actually reflect the fluid inside of them? So, remember, our system here, uh, this represents the time rate of change of the linear momentum of all the fluid particles in the system. And if we consider a system at a specific uh, instant in time when, you know, let's take a system right here shown in black and let's draw a control volume around it or else let's control, draw a control volume in space and take a snapshot of the fluid particles inside it at a given time. It doesn't matter. Uh, the idea here is that when those when that system and that control volume are coincident, that is at the instant in time that they contain all the same fluid particles, then there's really you know there's no difference between the actual group of particles inside. Um, so we could say that well, at this instant in time, our system contains all the same particles as the control volume, and thus any forces acting on the system also have to be experienced by the control volume. Right? And so at this instant in time, what this allows us to do is say these two statements are equivalent. The only difference is that on this one, we have to integrate, you know, we have to account for all of the, uh, the individual fluid particles. Whereas this one, we only have to worry about the region of space it occupies. Okay, this is, this is a really subtle uh, thing to think about. But what's nice here is that, you know, as this system flows by, we can simply say, all right, forget about that system. Let's look at the next system of particles, the next one that's coincident with that control volume an instant time later, right? And we can say, well, I know that I have forces acting on this control volume at some short time later, so I know the forces acting on this different system of particles this short time later. 
right? And in doing so, you can always paint a picture of how the forces on a control volume are affecting the system that's inside of that control volume at that very instant in time. Um, it's sort of like, all right, um, let's imagine we've got, uh, I'm trying to put this in a rigid body dynamics framework. Um, okay, let's say we're trying to compute uh, the forces that are acting on a, uh, a baseball as it's pitched over the plate and, you know, hit with a bat. Okay. The natural inclination is to say, well, I'm going to follow the baseball. I'm going to see how quickly it changes direction when it's hit by the bat. Right? I can, at the moment that, it's, that it has, experiences impact with the bat, I can so do a free body diagram. I can figure out what its acceleration is. But what if I told you that you're only allowed to look at, here, let's draw a little, um, okay, baseball, and we'll, we'll, we'll just call our bat, um, I don't know, we'll just say that this is the, this is the bat being swung towards the ball, right? You could draw a free body diagram of the baseball, but what if I told you that the only region of space you're allowed to look at is this volume right here. You're not allowed to follow the baseball, you're not allowed to follow the bat. All you're allowed to do is look at what happens inside a fixed volume in space. Well, then it becomes really useful to have some sort of notion uh, that at the instant in time where these meet you know, at, in the space, or when this baseball occupies the space, that the change in momentum going in and out of this control volume represents the forces that are acting on the baseball inside of that um, control volume, right? So uh, just, just kind of mull this over. Think about why it is that it's often advantageous to express forces on a fixed region of space than on a deforming kind of nebulous blob of fluid. And, uh, and recognize the equivalence that's going on here. Again, just to restate it, when a system of particles occupies a control volume, they experience all the same things, because they are the same thing. Forces acting on the system are also acting on the control volume, and so if we just keep taking different snapshots of slightly different systems occupying the same region in space, we can see an idea, get an idea of what the forces acting on each subsequent system are, while they each occupy that region of space. All right, so back to the question of vectors. Uh, what we saw here, all right, um, we can say time rate of change, the linear momentum of a system, is equal to the sum of the forces on the system, which at that instant time is also equal to the sum of the forces on the contents of the control volume. And we wrote down that uh, if we use the Reynolds transport theorem, we come up with an expression like this, where we've got uh, the <coughs> unsteady rate of change of linear momentum in a control volume and the convective term. And this kind of begs the question, as I said, what do we do with the fact that we've got vectors inside both of these? All right. it's, sort of a, it's sort of an abstract notion. Um, well, remember, the vectors are really just, the way I like to think of vectors are, if you have a vector equation, what you really have is a set of scalar equations, each pointing in a different direction, right? If I tell you um, v1 is equal to 3i plus 10j, and v2 is equal to 40i plus um, pi j, right? This isn't too difficult because you simply add up, look at only the i components, you say, well, the sum of these guys gives us 43i, and just in the j direction, we've got n plus pi. You don't have to worry about these two talking to each other, right? The two components remain different because they're orthogonal to one another. So the same thing applies when you're dealing with vector conservation laws. Recognize that we've got, um, oh man, I need to 
conserve some space here. Recognize that we've got a vector on this side. We've got vector terms in both of these side here. So it makes sense that we could, you know, it's just like we were able to split up the addition of those vectors, we can split up the equations of this vector into its constituent parts. So um, what this means is if we were to uh, consider that V is equal to U, V, and W components, how do we write this out for some of the forces in X, some of the forces in Y, some of the forces in Z only? Yeah. So if I was saying some of the forces in X, remember now I'm only looking at the X component, so instead of a vector, I only need to worry about the scalar quantity of, of F of X. So the forces in X is going to be equal to um, rate of change of uh, X momentum of the system equal to the unsteady term <coughs> and row over CB, row Alright, what do you think I put in this box here? <coughs> Just U, right? Okay. You draw the control surface of uh, All right, this box. What about this box? V still good. All right, it's because we need to recognize that the, the quantity that we're tracking, right, our intensive property here is little u, but it's still being convected across control volumes, or control surfaces, by this transpiration velocity here, this V dot N. It still tells us the direction it's flowing across a control surface, and if they're not aligned with one another, the, the you know the mag component of the velocity that's normal to the control surface. So great. So if we did this for y and z, we would end up with a set of three equations here, uh, which you know hopefully you recognize that if this is the i component, this is the j component, this is the k component. These three things are exactly equivalent to this single vector statement. It's just split up into its three constituent parts. So, you know, vector conservation laws aren't too, aren't too bad. It's just more bookkeeping in, 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 in shorthand. So, any, any questions on this so far? Show of hands if you're with me. You can, you know, you, you, you're getting what's going on with uh, this conservation in three directions. Cool. So, what leads to these forces um, on a control volume and the associated system? Well, we talked before about body and surface forces. Remember, body forces being, for example, gravitational surface forces, maybe being due to pressure or due to shear force, shear stresses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so, when we're dealing with a control volume and control surface analysis, we can end up with reaction forces caused by Changes in linear momentum, right? Just like this equation tells us, and this can cause because this can be caused because uh, the magnitude of the velocity can change, or the velocity can be redirected. So we change some of the momentum from the u direction to the y direction, or something, or to the v direction. Um, this, for example, is why airplanes work. The wings, there are a lot more subtleties to it, but uh, an easy way to model it is that the wings take flow that's coming in horizontally and direct some of it downward. So you have no Y momentum coming into your control volume, but you have some leaving. So the sum of the forces tells you there's something pushing up, or something's pushing the control volume down, right? Something's pushing down the control volume, that being the plane, because they try really hard to fall out of the sky. Yeah, they're really heavy. So they push down on the control volumes that are formed around the wings, and the reaction force from the fluid as it's directed downward, pushes the plane back up. Um, 
you can have fluid pressure forces acting on the control surfaces. For example, if you're talking about flow on a pipe, and we'll deal with this in a minute, uh, flow through a pipe, you're going to have to use usually Bernoulli or something to figure out what the pressures are on the inlet and outlet of the pipe and consider those in addition to the change in momentum. Um, you can have fluid friction forces. Again, the walls of the pipe may have some friction coefficient with the fluid that's flowing through the pipe and you need to account for the shearing influence on the fluid. Uh, you can have the weight of the fluid or sometimes the weight of non-fluid parts of the control volume. Um, the only body force that we worry about here uh, is gravity. All right? We're not going to be, I said before, you know, generally speaking, you can have body forces due to electrostatic fields, electromagnetic fields, what have you. Um, we're going to make things complicated enough already. We're going to just stick with good old gravity. Uh, that does not mean, however, that gravity is always going to be directed in the negative z direction. Okay, remember, we need to remember that gravity, gravitational acceleration is a field, it's a vector field. If we're standing on a horizontal plane, we have a z axis pointing directly upward, then it's convenient that it's only directed downward. But if we're dealing with a rotated coordinate system, it's not the case anymore. We need to remember that. Uh, so surface forces uh, tend to be exerted on whatever fluid is inside a control volume. Uh, let's illustrate this. So let's say we've got um, flow through a pipe here, right? Um, let's make this. Alright, so um, if we're interested in looking at the forces on the fluid inside of this pipe, uh, number one, we're going to have the weight of the fluid itself, right? There's our body force. Item number two, we might have a pressure force at this end if we have a P1. The chances are good, especially with the way this is configured, with a higher velocity at this end, the P1 and P2 are not the same, right? So if you've got a pipe inlet here, force that's driving the pre uh, that's driving the fluid is going to be equal to um, some you know this pressure times the area of this pipe the cross sectional area and on this side it's going to be this area times this pressure so we've got opposing pressure forces driving the fluid uh, additionally if we've got if we're assuming that there's viscosity and that we have a no slip condition you're going to be having the walls of the pipe itself pulling on the fluid in the form of a boundary layer, right, friction. And uh, the pressure for linear momentum. Oh, and then, for example, if we felt like, I don't know, if we felt like directing this pipe upward instead of just leaving it flat, then we now also have a redirection of our fluid momentum. So what before had no momentum in the vertical direction now has some. And so you're going to have a reaction force from the pipe. We generally draw this as um, we say Ry and Rx. That is the force on the fluid caused by the pipe. I've drawn these in positive directions, right? If we're assuming we've got x, y. Uh, we generally draw these on our fluid free body diagrams. Um, positively oriented and just let the negative sign fall out if it's going to be negative. Don't try to get ahead of the process here. We'll be seeing what, in the next example, what um, these reaction forces tend to look like. So um, surface forces, this is kind of a subtlety and I'm not sure how necessary it is, but they make a point of it in the book. Uh, surface forces tend to be exerted on stuff that's just outside the control volume, on things that are just inside of the control volume. So for example, if we say the control volume encloses the fluid here, then that means, you know, surface force one, pressure. Oops. It's exerted by fluid that's just outside this control surface on fluid that's just inside. Same goes here. The shear stress along the wall, if we say the wall is just outside the control surface, 
uh, or the control volume, then it's exerting some lateral frictional force against the fluids that's just inside. Okay, this is kind of a subtlety, and remember, control volumes. Um, you can pick almost any control volume you want, uh, and it tends to be that because you know any force has a equal and opposite reaction force. That, for example, if you picked a control volume that was somewhere that didn't have a lie along a boundary, then you're still it, it's not going to. Don't worry too much about this. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, anyway. So. Uh, all right. If we've got steady flow, remember, I, that's not supposed to be there yet. I just gave you the answer. But if we've got, a, if we have steady flow, just as before, we love when we have steady flow because it allows us to cancel this term out completely and ignore everything as volume integral, right? So if we say this is equal to zero, then we end up with the steady momentum equation. And this one's big, we're gonna use this a lot because steady flow constitutes, you know, mo most of the flows we're gonna deal with can be thought of as steady. And again, what's nice about this is now, if you understand sort of the trajectory we've taken throughout this uh, whole derivation, um, we have a chunk of fluid particles, a system, which is nasty mathematically. It's Lagrangian. We don't want to follow every fluid particle. And now all of a sudden the forces on it can be computed just by looking at the, uh, the velocities and masses flowing into and outside some imaginary box we've drawn around it. This is great. This is the literal black box approach. You can look at only the edges of the control volume and get an idea of what's happening inside. Uh, we tend not to use this by itself, but because we have to now figure out like how what the volumes flowing in and out of control or volumes are, or what the velocities flowing in and out are. For example, here, um, we usually need to use this in addition to uh, additional um, constraints. We have to form a system of equations to solve different types of problems. For example, conservation of mass. If we're looking at this problem. If we're given a velocity in, a mean velocity in, we have to compute mean velocity out. How do we do that? We recognize conservation of mass, yeah? So we could say flow rate in has to equal flow rate out. We can find out what the velocity is. If we're given P1 here and we're given the velocity here, we need to figure out what the pressure force acting on the fluid in this direction is. How do we calculate P2? We use Bernoulli, right? Because everything's on the same streamline. So we could say, well, we got our P1 plus rho GZ1 plus one half rho V1 is equal to P2 plus one half rho V2 plus rho GZ2. And you could solve for the pressure here with the velocity that you calculated from conservation of mass, and then you can take those velocities, those pressures and everything, and you can plug them into all your pressure forces and your linear momentum equation and learn everything, right? So, um, here's some examples of uh, control volumes. Here's a, a flow through a straight pipe, which as I said, um, similar to this, but a little simpler, um, where we've got a control volume that only includes the fluid, we've got pressures at each end, those pressures induce forces on the fluid inside, um, maybe we have shear stresses between the pipe and the fluid, etc. Um, in this case, uh, if it's steady flow, then here's our x momentum, right? Surface integral of u rho v dot n. Um, it's going to be equal to, and we have to figure out what the sum of the forces is. So uh, in this case, right, um, this, is, this is kind of a weird one. We're talking about a gas, and we're given different pressures and temperatures. Um, but the idea here is that if there's less momentum coming out on the right-hand side, right, if stuff is slowed down or if it's cooled down and therefore compressed or something, they, um, the, the momentum flux command of this side may be smaller than the momentum flux in on this end. 
And what that means is that we have some reaction force in the pipe, probably due to friction. Okay. So if we've got something like a 180 degree bend here, uh, well, let's say now the control volume includes not only the fluid, but also the, just the, the it's a little bit larger, it includes the pipe. Okay? Our forces here have to now include the pressure forces on both these ends, right? So we've got some pressure at this side, some pressure here. Um, let's, oh, it's already drawn here. Pressure, pressure. We've got momentum flux coming in this side and getting redirected out this side. So we already got pressure pushing the pipe this way. If we've got momentum flux coming in, it's also going to push the pipe towards me. And then you have some anchoring force. If you're assuming this is tied down or bolted onto a flange or something, there's some anchoring force that's on the pipe acting on the pipe and therefore is being transferred to the fluid because of equal opposite reactions. And so if you drew, drew the free body diagram, it would look like this, where you've got anchoring forces in X, in Y, and Z, which could just be you know, transferred by bolts or your pipe hangers, what have you. The weight of the pipe and the water inside of it, and pressure force on this side, pressure force on this side, and then the redirection of fluid momentum. And so you've got a lot of forces acting on things. Um, so, I just threw a lot of unsubstantiated stuff at you, uh, but let's go ahead and practice it now. So here's an opportunity, uh, alright, yeah, we're doing okay on time. Uh, alright. So what we've got here, This pipe. We're going to assume we've got steady flow, right? Steady flow through a 90 degree reducing area elbow. Okay, at the inlet, we're given a pressure, 220 kilopascals here, and an inlet area. At the outlet, we're given an area and a velocity. Okay, and we know that it discharges into the atmosphere. So, question is, how much force is required to hold the elbow in place? That is, if we were to put a, an anchor on here, a pipe hanger, or if we were to bolt this flange here, what force is going to have to be transferred to that anchoring point so that the pipe doesn't go shooting off into space? Alright, so first step here, let's pick our control volume. Um, Anybody, remember, the nice thing here is that uh, literally any control volume will give you the right answer, but there are definitely ones that are going to be easier for us to use than others. Uh, so anyone have a suggestion of a control volume to use? I want to be the brave soul. Well, all right, we have float. At one and two, right? We're given information about the flow at these points. So it would make sense that we put our control surfaces at across one and across two, right? Does that seem like a logical first choice? All right, we also know the direction of the flow here. It's in the x direction here, and the y direction here. If we want to make things easier for ourselves, we're also gonna to wanna to make those control surfaces perpendicular to the velocity, right? So that all of the velocity our v dot n is either just positive or negative. We don't have any cosines of theta or any angular flows. So let's say that's one control surface, and that's another control surface. Okay. The rest of the choice is kind of up to you. You could make the control surface just enclose the pipe. That's fine. But we're going to go ahead and make our control surface look like this. Oh, sorry. Okay. It's just a box enclosing the pipe and the fluid with um, edges here at one and two. Okay, so let's go ahead and draw a uh, free body diagram of the water and pipe.
All right, so what do we know about this? We said we've got an absolute pressure here. And we've got area one, right? Here we've got P2 is equal to, what can we assume? There's an assumption we can make here. Right? Well, it's, it's atmospheric, right? So um, it's zero if we're talking gauge pressure. And we're going to move to gauge pressure in a minute, because gauge pressure is nicer. But um, we've got absolute pressure here, so we've got the <coughs> atmospheric. Yeah? And we've got A2, which is given. We'll go ahead and write it down. Um, 0 0.025 e squared. A1 is equal to, what was it, 0 0.01? 1 meters squared. Okay. So we've got pressure forces acting here and here. Uh, the thing is, we've also got pressure forces acting everywhere else, right? Like this thing is just getting pushed and pulled on all over the place. But um, remember what's nice about using atmospheric pressure, or using, using uh, gauge pressure, is that just like in the case with the dam, right, with the, or, the, or the vertical wall of a tank, atmospheric pressure acts equally if we're not assuming, we're assuming atmospheric pressure is constant, right? We're not worrying about the hydrostatic pressure gradient or the, or the aerostatic pressure gradient. Um, pressure up here is the same as the pressure down here, unless you're going way up to high elevations. Um, so we've got this uniform pressure field that's pushing on this thing equally from all directions, which means that the atmospheric pressure just cancels out, for the most part. Um, they, uh, so for the sake of this problem, what we can say is that um, the, all that we really care about is the, uh, the difference relative to the at, uh, atmospheric pressure. So that means gauge pressure, right? Gauge pressure is 101 kilopascals, uh, or sorry, atmospheric pressure is 101 kilopascals. So that means that the absolute pressure here is going to be 200, or the gauge pressure here, sorry, is going to be 220 kilopascals minus atmospheric, which is going to be equal to uh, about 119 kilopascals gauge. Gauge pressure here is going to be equal to zero. Um, KPA gauge, right? All right. Uh, what else? What other forces do we have acting on this chunk of? Well, we've got the weight of the fluid in the pipe. Um, and then going into the pipe here, we've got we've got V1 coming out of the pipe, we've got V2. Sixteen meters per second. V1 is equal to we don't know. And then finally We've got the action of the pipe pushing on the fluid, which ends up being, because of load transfer, equal to the forces of the anchoring system on the pipe. Whatever pushes on the pipe, the pipe transfers to the fluid inside of it, et cetera, et cetera. So we have our Rx and our Ry, the reaction forces of the pipe against the fluid. And that constitutes, yeah, and so that's it for our free body diagram on this thing. Okay, so now let's go ahead and write out our, um, so we picked control volume, draw on the surface of body forces. Uh, let's go ahead and write down our governing equations. First up, conservation of mass, right? So this tells us DDT, Integral CV, rho, dv, 
plus yeah, rho of the surface area, rho v dot n dA is equal to zero. Anything we can cancel here? Right, because we've assumed steady flow, yeah? Alright, so we end up with the integral of the control surface only, which, based on our lecture last time, just kind of devolves into m dot out minus m dot in equals zero. Right? If we're assuming density is constant, then this also turns into um, Q out, which is equal to V2 A2 minus Q in, which is equal to V1 A1 is equal to zero, right? Okay. Uh, Next governing equation, so let's uh, conservation, <coughs> linear momentum. PDT, CV, rho V, D plus C S. Uh, we're assuming that our velocity distribution is uniform over the inlets and outlets. So, and we assume we only have two places where flow occurs across the control surface, at the inlet and outlet. So this turns into, um, I'll go through more steps here. This turns into integral CS1, the, or the inlet, right? Rho V, V dot N, DA, plus surface integral over the outlet row at at the inlet our velocity is equal to what? Just V one I, right? In the I direction. It's got an X component only. The vector velocity. Yeah. Um. V2 is equal to <laughs> what? It's got nothing in the x direction, right? We're given a value here of 16 meters per second. It's pointing down in the, along the y-axis, right? So minus 16 meters per second j. So those are both constant. Um, here we've got so we've got velocity in. What directions are normal pointing? Like that, right? How about here? <coughs> Down. Cool. So let's talk about this term. V dot n at the inlet. This is going to be V1, V1, V2, V2, right? V1 dotted with the normal at the inlet. It's going to be just equal to negative 
V1, right? V2 dot of normal at the outlet is going to be equal to positive V2, right? Because they both have point in the same direction. And then because we're assuming that the velocities are uniform over each of these areas, or the inlet and the outlet area, this just becomes <clears throat> rho v1 Here's our statement of conservation of linear momentum, right? The flux, the, the, yeah. So, next step. we have our governing equations and we figured out how these assumptions simplify them, let's go ahead and write out our sum of the forces. Let's go ahead and do the x direction first, right? Sum of the forces in x is going to be equal to what? Pressure force here, pressure 1, A1, plus what else? Rx Is that it? I think that's it acting in the x direction. Anything else? Is equal to Oh, sorry, this shouldn't be zero, this should be some of the forces. going to be equal to now the x component of this expression, right? Which means negative rho u1 uh, v1 a1 plus Anything, is there anything in the x direction in this term right here, right? Everything is in, is in the y direction, at the outfit on in the v2 term. So plus zero, okay? u1 is equal to v1 here, right? Because all of v is in the u direction, is in the x direction. So this simply turns into v1 squared. So what we end up with is that, remember we're trying to solve for the anchoring force, so Rx is going to be equal to now P1, A1 minus rho V1 squared A1. Okay, do we have everything we need to solve this? Not quite. We still need to know what V1 actually is. Yeah, and so to get V1, we're going to go ahead and turn to our conservation of mass very quickly and just recognize that, remember, mass in equals mass out. Or A1, V1 is equal to A2, V2, right? We made the assumption already over here that because the flow rate is uniform over the inlet and outlet and density is constant, that mass in, mass out simply equal, it becomes volumetric flow rate in equals volumetric flow rate out. So, what we end up getting for that
is that V1 is equal to V2, A2 over A1, or equal to 4 meters per second. Okay. Now do we have everything that we need to solve this? Gauge pressure P1, yes. A1, given. Rho, it's water. V1, right here. A1 again, given. Yeah? So if we plug all those values in here, and just type it into our calculator, what we end up getting is that Rx is equal to negative 1.5. 3.5 kilonewtons, which is about, well, it's about 303 pounds of force. Okay. It's pretty large, actually. You think about it? 300 pounds of force from a little thing. We're talking one centimeter, or we're talking, uh, sorry, one, this would be 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. Um, and with an outlet, you know, we're, this this is not a this is not a huge pipe fitting. I can, that big at the inlet, that big at the outlet, directing water four meters per second in, sixteen meters per second out. This is well within the realm of stuff that you see in in normal shipboard plumbing. And yet we've got an anchoring force just to keep it from flying off the end of the pipe. Three hundred three pounds force in the x direction. Okay. Um, for the sake of time, we're going to just kind of breeze through how we would do it in the y direction. But same thing applies. Is there any y momentum going across here? No. So this term goes to zero. Is there any pressure force acting in the y direction here? Nope. Here? Yes. But the pressure force acting here is atmospheric, right? So it just goes to zero. We've got the weight of the fluid here. And then we have the velocity, so we end up with R y is simply equal to uh, so P two A two minus W. Uh, is this a, be a plus? Um, Rho V2 A No, no, yep, yep, that's gonna be negative. Sorry, I was doing <laughs> some of the forces in my head and I had R written down. Um, however, we are uh, and actually that should be a negative also. Um, but uh, we as we just said, atmospheric pressure here. Um, and we have, uh, we're, we've made the assumption here, it's, it's given in this, the problem actually, in the solution. Let's go ahead and just ignore the weight of the fluid right here, because it's, it will show it's fairly it, minimal compared to the actual uh, redirection force here, but the reaction force in the y direction ends up being itself uh, negative 600 40 newtons, which is about equal to 144 pounds of force. So that's just in the y direction to keep this thing from launching. Yeah, this thing from going airborne. So that's an example of how we use a combination of conservation of linear momentum, conservation of mass, and just some simple information about the flow in and out of the pipe. Again, we're not worrying about everything that happened here. We didn't have to worry about the radius of curvature and the pressure gradients acting on the fluid, we're able to account for the gross effects simply by looking at the outlet and at the inlet, which is a really, really nice feature. Okay, so in the last few minutes here, let me hand back some exams. So, <clears throat> Some of you may have noticed that grades got updated on Canvas last night. Um, those of you that logged on and looked, probably saw exam grades posted. Um, the exam grades that posted on Canvas don't match these, because these are raw scores written on here. 
and the ones in Canvas are actually curved. Okay, the average score for the exam was a 63 um, after the curve. I curved up the average to a 70. Um, and let's see. So it's probably, it's a little bit, uh, it's probably the, the worst possible time for them to issue uh, midterm feedback forms to you guys right after I hand back the uh, that tough exam, but while I'm passing these out, 